off into the Iowa files. Kudos to you Eskimos for making it out today. I think that's fantastic. Leo Landis, our presenter today, is known to quite a few of you. And if you don't know him, you should, because he's fascinating. He's got a huge brain in that head of his. He is the State of Iowa Curator for the State Historical Society of Iowa. He attended ISU and majored in history, and he has a master's degree in historical administration. When I emailed Leo asking about presenting at today's Iowa Files, I said, what would you like to present about? What can you talk about? That led to a long <coughs> email from him with so many ideas and suggestions, we could just do Leo Landis <laughs> Files for the next year. Um, you want to know about the history of bacon in Iowa? <laughs> this is your guy. The, want to know about the history of the fantastic state fair? This is your guy. So he's got the bacon thing covered from beginning to end, kind of, in a way. Um, and the caucuses. He has been an expert comment uh, uh, presenter on C-SPAN. So did you know that the caucuses are coming up? Maybe you've heard, yeah. I'm not sure if you're all getting all the knocks on your door the same way that we are. So we are just thrilled to take advantage of this man's tremendous knowledge today. Um, thanks to the members of the West Des Moines Historical Society, the Friends Foundation of the West Des Moines Public Library, and you folks. Thank you very much, and with no further ado, Mr. Leo Landis. Thank you, Gail. <laughs> Thank you to all of you who uh, did come out today. We got a nice crowd, so that's great. Uh, one of the stories, you know, I, I grew up in Clive, and uh, some of my fondest memories are in West Des Moines. I was going to Holiday Pool as a six and seven year old in Holiday Park and was telling John Naughton up front, uh, he played in Windsor Little League Baseball, but my birthday's in August. So West Des Moines let eight and nine year olds play baseball uh, back in the 70s. So I played Little League Baseball. My uh, team when I was eight and nine won the eight and nine year old championship, the Broncos. So that's a highlight of my boyhood uh, baseball. Uh, went to Crestview School and then uh, went into the Catholic school system. So uh, I've, I've got great roots and, and fond memories and spent time at the uh, old West Des Moines Public Library. This, this branch is a little bit bigger than that one used to be. Uh, so uh, libraries are special to me as well. So thanks to the library as well for hosting this event. And again, thanks to all of you for coming out today. I want to talk about a story that I bet none of us heard when we were in elementary school. And, and even in high school, if we heard the story uh, about desegregation of schools in the United States, we didn't talk about Iowa. We talked about Brown versus Board of Education. That's the landmark case in 1954 out of Topeka, Kansas, where the U.S. Supreme Court rules unanimously that schools cannot segregate based on uh, race. <clears throat> well. 86 years before that, Iowa had a similar case, and so that's the case we're going to talk about. Uh, Susan Clark, she was, sometimes people say 13-year-old girl, sometimes a 12-year-old girl. She was born in 1854 in Muscatine. Uh, her father, Alexander, and her mother, Catherine, had come to Iowa in the 1840s, or at least her dad did. Uh, Catherine was in Iowa City. Uh, her parents are raising a family in Muscatine, and... After the Civil War, and Alexander Clark had been active in Republican politics, even though he couldn't vote as an African American, but he was working for civil rights issues in Iowa through the 1850s and 1860s. So after the Civil War, his daughter's going to a segregated school in Muscatine, and she is the plaintiff in the case, her name is Susan Clark, that establishes Iowa's uh, desegregated schools. But it doesn't just end with her. So let's start. Uh, with her obituary. Let's see, I am still turned on, so there we go. My, I'm a little slow on that. There we go. Thank you. So uh, here we are, her obituary from June 4th, 1925. Uh, talks about her dad actually more than her <laughs> uh, until the second paragraph. It does say she was born in 1854, so if the case takes place in 1867, at least when she first tries to go to an make, make a school integrated in Muscatine, she's 13 years old. As I said, you'll sometimes see that she was 12, at least based on her obituary, being born in 1854, she's going to be 13 when uh, the case takes place. It says Ms. Hawley, because that's her married name, she marries uh, the Methodist Church, uh, was largely segregated through the 18, er, 1800s and early 20th century. 
So her husband is a minister in the African Methodist Episcopal Church, and so she is Susan Clark Hawley when she dies. Uh, it does, as I said, mention that she's the first colored graduate of the Muscatine High School in the class of 1871. She's a member of the colored, and usually if I'm reading it, I'll re use their terminology unless it's profane or, or offensive. Uh, I'll usually use African American as opposed to any other term. But she's a member of the colored Order of the Eastern Star and Heroines of Jericho, both branches of the Masonic Order, and of the African Methodist Episcopal Church. Mrs. Clara Jones, her niece at whose home she died, is the daughter of Mrs. Rebecca Appleton, an old resident of Muscatine. She is survived by one brother, Alexander Clark of Oskaloosa, and one niece, Clara Jones of Chicago. And uh, Susan was interred in Muscatine next to her father. So uh, lives from 1854 till 1925. And as I said, doesn't mention the lawsuit or the case at all that uh, she plays a role, only that she's the first African-American graduate of, the, of Muscatine High School. As I said, her family uh, comes to Iowa in the 1840s, at least her dad. There's Alex Clark is how he's uh, abbreviated. Catherine, there's her sister Rebecca. She has a brother Charles, and uh, they have a live-in uh, servant or friend, uh, Sarah Jackson. Uh, and actually, Charles Matthews, uh, it doesn't say the relationship, but he's living in the house. So these are her mother and her sister. Uh, her brother isn't born yet in 1850. So it uh, says, you know, he's a barber. Uh, he's from Pennsylvania. Catherine was born in Virginia. Most likely she was enslaved as a little girl. Her family eventually gained their freedom, and so she was in Iowa City when uh, she and Alexander met. So that's her short biographical background. But the fact that she was born in Virginia, and this is the 1850 federal census, tells you she was most likely uh, living as an enslaved child for at least part of her life. So here's the 1860 census page. So uh, it's a little tougher to see. I know I didn't crop it for you quite as well. Uh, the Clarks down here, here's Alexander, Catherine, uh, Rebecca. Uh, then you've got Alexander Jr. And Susan is the last line down there. She's uh, a six-year-old female. Actually, that's Susan right there. Excuse me. There's female, uh, five years old. And uh, they'll use both the letters B and M for her family, either mulatto or black on the census uh, schedules when you look them up in the, the federal and state census. So uh, there's Susan right there, five years old, female, black. And in Muscatine City, Muscatine County, Iowa. So part of the background on segregated schools and what Justice Cole, our Supreme Court Justice, uses as the basis for making his decision is to look at the statutes connected to education in Iowa. And so in 1846, the law on common schools stated that a school shall be open and free alike to all white persons. So we weren't even providing for the education of African American children in Iowa when we first became a state. The statute on our book, so before we get too all self-congratulatory about Iowa, uh, we weren't real enlightened uh, when we first put our statutes on the books. So uh, to all white persons in the district between the ages of 5 and 21. Then 1848, uh, <clears throat> acts are repealed, uh, but it keeps on that a district shall keep on record a list of all the white persons in the district between the ages of 5 and 21 years. 1851, all real and personal property, sorry, that's a typo on there, of blacks and mulattoes in the state shall be exempt from taxation for school purposes because they didn't have the uh, rights to go to school. So we won't tax African Americans about that. Uh, 1857, common schools are placed under the management of a board of education with the provision that it could be abolished or reorganized after 1863, uh, wanting to look at statutes after that new constitutional amendment. Uh, it was abolished in 1864. So the Constitution of Iowa, which was revised in 1857, uh, states that the board shall provide for the education of all youths. So now it's inclusive. So that 1857 Constitution, and Clark had been agitating uh, 
along with other African Americans, and I say agitating in a good way, not being, I mean, he was being a pest, but he's like, I'm a citizen, I'm uh, you know, a free man, my family deserves to have the same rights. So he and other African Americans, uh, we had just under 2,000 African Americans living in the state in the 1857. Uh, but when they put forward to strike the word white on juries and uh, voting rights and serving in militias, when it goes forward as a constitutional amendment, uh, the white men, and, and so now you'll rarely hear me talk about voters in Iowa. If it's before 1868, I'll say white men in Iowa. And if it's before 1920, I'll say men in Iowa. I don't use the term voters. That sounds like it's more inclusive. In Iowa, you need to keep in mind who those voters are, uh, just so you're aware of the history. Uh, so in 1857, when they're looking at those statutes, it's only white men who have the right to vote. Uh, then in 1858, the 7th General Assembly of Iowa passed an act that provided a district board of directors shall provide for the education of colored youth in separate schools. So we put onto the books in the state that schools can be segregated. Uh, the Iowa Supreme Court, though, declares it unconstitutional because it conflicts with the 1857 Constitution and the role of the Board of Education. So the legislature tries to provide for segregated schools and the Iowa Supreme Court rules it can't happen. Then in 1860, the State Board of Education uh, <clears throat> uh, passed an act for common schools for the instruction of youth that had no exemption on taxation of property for colored persons, so African American people. I may change that the next time I do this talk. Uh, and so then in 1862 and 1868, the laws of instruction that are passed by the legislature also make no mention of schools based on color. So that's a little bit of the historical background on what's leading up to 1867. Plus, from 1861 to 1865, you may be aware there was this major conflict in American history called the Civil War about slavery. So you've got that going on, too. <clears throat> the reports, then, that are issued. So I, I may have to backtrack, but I'll state it now. So September of 1867, I know I've got an upcoming slide, is when uh, Susan tries to enroll in the local uh, ward school, district school, that is not segregated, even though Muscatine has a school for African-American students. Uh, Alexander and Catherine send her to the local nearby school. And the Muscatine District Court, the way the Iowa court system set up, you go to district court first. And it's not the Clarks who have a problem, obviously, because the Muscatine School is initially letting her attend, but the Muscatine School District says, no, no, uh, let's put a stop to this. And so <coughs> the district court issues a uh, writ of mandamus and says she's got, she, she must be allowed to attend that school. That happens in December of 60. Uh, seven, if my memory is correct. And so then it goes to the Iowa Supreme Court for the June term. It's an April 14th uh, trial is when it starts. And what's, this is the Iowa Supreme Court report page. I may now backtrack to it, but we'll jump to the timeline on how that happened. I'm pointing that way. So September 10th, 1867, Susan Clark attempts to attend grammar school number two in Muscatine. The district court rules in favor of the Clarks and the Muscatine School Board appeals the case. So uh, love the late Chief Justice Cady. He often gets uh, credited for the Supreme Court hearing cases outside of Des Moines. That was going on in the 1800s. So the Iowa Supreme Court is meeting in Davenport in 1868 when they hear the Clark case. Uh, so it's heard in Davenport. The judges are Chief Justice Dillon, Justice J. Beck, Justice J. Cole, and Justice J. Wright. Uh, so those are your, uh, should be C. Cole, actually. Uh, he's Chester Cole. Uh, the case is ruled in a three to one majority for upholding the district court's ruling. Wright is the dissenting vo voice. Cole writes the opinion. He was a Harvard-educated lawyer. He came to Iowa because it was a promising place, he thought. 
gets appointed to the Supreme Court. He's not the Chief Justice, he's an Associate Justice of the Supreme Court, so it's Cole who writes the opinion, and we'll see how well I can give that to you. So, uh, <clears throat> there we go. Uh, the key phrase, and there's actually going to show up in a newspaper article as well. Uh, see, uh, they cannot deny a youth admission to any particular school because of his, they use his, because of his color, nationality, religion, or the like. So it's actually a broader ruling than just on uh, the, the nationality or the, the cultural background of the person. It's, it's based on race, nationality, or color, nationality, or religion, or the like. So that's the ruling. Well, that was the concern. David made a comment about the Irish. The Irish were not well loved because they tended to be Catholic and uh, the United States is, and, and my great, uh, my grandmother is a Carmody. Uh, that's why I went to parochial schools. Uh, so I've got no problem with Irish Catholics for the record. Uh, <laughs> and uh, the Irish were viewed nearly as, as, as bad as African, bad, as negatively as African Americans. So part of what Justice Cole is saying is, you know, if we start allowing for segregation of schools in Iowa based on uh, color, why not say, we're going to say, you know, we, we're going to have separate schools for the Irish or separate schools for the German or et cetera. Now, sometimes those groups wanted their own schools, but... Uh, that we weren't going to allow municipalities to establish their own separate schools. So that's <clears throat> uh, what Justice Cole writes. Justice Wright essentially uh, is saying a separate but equal ruling is, is essentially what he is arguing for, that you know, as long as the, the schools are provided, uh, <coughs> that uh, as long as it's promoting uh, welfare and the best interests of the schools for a separate school for colored children. They're kept within the proper districts and have furnished to them necessary and suitable instruction furnished other children. So as long as it's, you know, suitable and similar, he doesn't use that term, it's, it's okay. And, and his dissent does not uh, get challenged, I mean, does, does not hold the day, it's the other three. Well, not all Iowans are real excited about this, but most are think it's okay. I'll start with the middle one, the Burlington Hawkeye, since it's the uh, earliest report. And it's down here at the bottom. It says, Susan V. Clark, extra A in her name on that one, versus the Independent District of Muscatine County, affirmed the case involved the question of the right of colored children to attend the public schools. The highest legal tribunal in this state has thus decided that they have this right. So uh, Burlington was a fairly uh, by today's standards, progressive town, the, by that, the, that era's standards, progressive town, their editor. Uh, Republicans, for the most part, supported integrated schools in Iowa. The Hawkeye was a largely Republican-oriented paper, so they were okay with it. Uh, we'll jump over to Monticello, so Jones County, northeast Iowa. I, I'm presuming everybody knows Burlington's southeast Iowa. Sorry about that, but just in case you didn't know. Also the uh, oldest newspaper Yeah, though Dubuque sometimes argues with him, John. <laughs> uh, take it up with Woodward Publications Incorporated. Uh, so the Monticello paper says a nice decision, and that's about the only good thing it says. Uh, the Supreme Court of Iowa has just decided in a case brought before it upon appeal that Negro children may attend schools with white ones, and then this gets italicized. So even when there is a school purposely for Negro children in the same town, that's all in italics. The case in point was one brought from the city of Muscatine, it and it starts to use offensive language. Uh, it appears that there was already established a school for Negro children, but the parent of one of the little, quote, pickaninnies, unquote, so again, using language we would not use today, uh, sought to introduce his offspring into the white schools. The directors very naturally and properly refused the Negro admittance and the irate 
citizen, so they're not even really ready to acknowledge that Andrew Clark is a citizen, so citizen is in quotes, <clears throat> at once got a mandamus from the district court compelling the admission of the child, and the Supreme Court of this state sustained the decision of the court below. If this isn't practical miscegenation, 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 there we go. That's always a hard word for me to say. So uh, mixing of races. And actually on the Iowa books, we did allow for people of different colors to marry by 1860. So uh, that, that's a different story and a different issue, but uh, he's concerned about it, the editor of the Express. Fairly illustrated, then we are no judge. Verily, the glories of Mexico. And this is where, you know, if, if you think anti-Mexico sentiment is something more recent in the last 50 years, Mexico gets held up because you've got mixing of Europeans, native peoples, and <clears throat> African Americans. So, you know, we're going to be as bad as Mexico because of this. So if verily the glories of Mexico are near at hand, had anybody told the abolitionists of Iowa seven years ago that this would be the ultimate result of their teachings, he would have been loudly and fiercely denounced as a falsifier. But under our beautiful radical rule, we are progressing, you know, exclamation point. Let them go on, however. Let social equality be the rallying cry. And if we do not sadly misjudge the people, it should be the men of Iowa, uh, the men of this state, they will repudiate next November both the doctrine and its teachers. So he is not happy. It's essentially an editorial. It's his column. It doesn't you know, get listed. It's, it's just in with the other news. But it's, it's yeah. It's clearly editorial. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. He's giving his slant. And then uh, the Cedar Valley Times, which was a Cedar Rapids paper, actually has a, a, a you know, one that we can be proud of as Iowans saying, all youth in the state of Iowa equal before the law. Almost, you know, essentially quoting the uh, lines from Justice Cole in his uh, ruling. So it goes on to say, you know, the questions, I'm going to not read the whole thing. The Monticello paper needs the full context. Uh, we look upon this very important decision uh, involving, as it does, a principle of vital importance in <clears throat> the elevation of the ne Negroes of our state uh, in the seals of intellectual uh, being and fitting them for taking an active part and setting intelligently upon the great question which ere long ago they as citizens of the state will have the opportunity of taking part. And so if we want African Americans to be active citizens, they need access to the same level of education. So uh, the Cedar Valley Times essentially applauds uh, the, the decision and it, you know a week before the Monticello Express goes on its rant. But just because there's the Clark case in 68 doesn't change things in Iowa. Des Moines had segregated schools. This is our city directory from 1873 in Des Moines. I realize I'm in West Des Moines. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> in Des Moines this is the 1873 city directory excerpt on schools and we've got African-Americans segregated in Des Moines in 1873. So Clark gets ignored by some communities. Uh, Keokuk, and also, that'll be the next image that comes up, try, integrates their elementary schools, but tries to keep their high schools segregated. And so there are two cases in 1875 in Keokuk that affirm Clark and say, no, you can't segregate schools in Iowa. Uh, and as you're going to see, Dubuque is still trying it in 1877. But <clears throat> the argument, and I've only had a chance to dig into this a little bit with the Des Moines schools, is the argument you often see saying, oh, the African Americans in Des Moines want their own colored segregated school. So that's why we have a segregated school. Whether that really was the case, hard to say, but that's one of the arguments I've read in the Des Moines papers of the early 1870s on why Des Moines is persisting with segregated schools in light of the Clark case. And, and really it's only an issue in towns that have a large enough population to have African American students. So, you know, if coal mining's not huge yet in the 1860s, early 70s in southern Iowa where you start to get African Americans as coal miners, so <clears throat> 
you don't see a lot of difficulty uh, in the, the 1870s and 1880s in small town Iowa. It's only in the larger cities that taxpayers say, sure, we'll support an African American segregated school because we don't want uh, our children to have to go to school with African American children. So here's the two Dubuque, uh, excuse me, the two uh, uh, Keokuk stories. This is running in the Fort Madison paper uh, to the Fort Madison, excuse me, the Fort Madison uh, correspondent to the Keokuk, one of the Keokuk papers, actually Burlington, because that says Hawkeye, uh, from October, and that Gerald Smith versus the Independent School District of uh, Keokuk, and he's a bright young man in Keokuk. Uh, he tries to attend the school. He goes to the central school building. He was sitting in algebra, uh, and the principal came in and said, sorry, you can't be in this school. And so Gerald Smith files suit. Uh, then there's one other, yeah, the Burlington Hawkeye, October 20th, 1874, is the date when the case uh, is generated, and then it's heard by the district courts in 1875. So there's Gerald Smith. Uh, that court ruling is June uh, of 1875, and then Charles Dove versus the Independent School District of Keokuk. Those are both segregation cases and high school cases in Keokuk where they're trying to keep their high school segregated. And that what those affirm Clark on the high school level saying, you know, you might have thought that Clark only applied to elementary schools. No, it applies to all schools. So Keokuk is trying to segregate through 74 into early 1875. In fact, through early 1875, but by the fall term, then uh, they are not. And so here is from the Dubuque Daily Times, February 10th, 1877. Pretty much everyday business over on the left side of the columns as you're looking at it. And then, uh, <clears throat> I want to make sure I get the right one. Yeah, this this was all one column or maybe two. I've laid it out so that it all runs. Uh, on a PowerPoint slide nicely, but on the second from the left, uh, the school board says, it having been represented that a number of colored children of this district have recent, or had recently been admitted to the ward schools, and that as a consequence, the attendance at the colored school had become much reduced, Mr. Ham submitted the following resolution, which was seconded by Mr. Thompson. Resolved that the colored children now in the ward schools be required to attend the colored school. So Dubuque is saying, we set up this school for African American children and they're not going to it. Let's make them go to it. And so they take a vote and it wins four votes for, two votes against. And so Dubuque in February of 1877 at their school board meeting says, we're gonna segregate our, we're gonna keep our segregated school segregated. <clears throat> in spite of Smith, in spite of Clark. And so then, uh, let's see, that was February 10th, a week later, or not even a week later, on February 14th, uh, the story is, on Monday morning, Joseph Howard, a colored man well known through the city, made application for admission of his child to the first word school. I think it's his daughter, Carrie. He's got two uh, school age daughters, and I believe Carrie is the one who's the youngest one. Uh, the child having been refused permission in obedience to the resolution of the board last Thursday last, the refusal of the first word principal was based entirely on the inhibition of the board as we are informed. So. Uh, Mr. Howard gets an attorney to file a writ of mandamus saying, hey, you can't do this. And so he's saying, you know, hey, we've had these lawsuits in our state that say you cannot segregate schools. And so it, it goes on, uh, you know, that sending his child to a, if given the choice of sending her to the colored school or keeping her at home, he doesn't want to do that. He wants her to go to the nearby ward school. So then... I don't know that that is related to Justice Cole. Yeah, that was something I haven't had a chance to dig into, but I, I'm not aware, I should say that. I don't know, but I'm not aware that they were related. Uh, sorry, this gets a little tough to, to read again uh, from where you are, but this is now on February 24th, 1877. It's the general uh, district, or excuse me, the school board minutes, uh, just like some newspapers still uh, will print on occasion. And uh, on the far, 
right as you're looking at it, I may have said left, I really meant right, sorry about that. Uh, in the matter of Mondamus suit against the district, the following was served on me uh, to wit. Writ of Mondamus admitted from the report having already been published in full. Uh, I accepted service forthwith, called to be person of Professor Brownson. He read the same and I directed him to comply, which is the saying you need to let young, Mrs. Howard, young Ms. Howard into your school. And so then uh, the last line of the school board, last section on the school board minute says, on motion that the report was adopted, uh, the colored school was conse consequently declared discontinued, and on motion of Mr. Thompson, the president was directed to assign Ms. Keller a position. She was the teacher at the school. So uh, it's like, oh, okay, I guess we can't keep our school for African-American students open. So that's the last case, almost, you know, 10 years, not, 10 years, uh, not quite 10 years, I should say, well, 10 years, uh, nine and a half years from when uh, Susan Clark uh, first tries to go to school in Muscatine, Iowa schools are till, still trying to uh, be segregated, at least in some communities. I didn't think I hit something, there we go. Uh, <clears throat> just to, so this is the Howards there on there. Uh, this is the 1880 uh, Dubuque population census. I'll see if I can find the Howards on it. There's Joseph. Carrie is the youngest daughter right down there. And again, it's three years after that, but she's the one who's listed at school. So I'm guessing it's Carrie who was the, the plaintiff in that case. So besides uh, Susan Clark, know the name of uh, Carrie Howard. And uh, then we're going to carry on back to, so what became of, of Susan Clark? Uh, she marries, uh, by 1880, her husband uh, is a Methodist Episcopal minister. So let me track her down on here. Uh, there's Richard and Susan Hawley. Uh, though at this time he looks, yeah, he's a preacher and she's keeping house. Uh, they did have one daughter who died as a toddler. So they never had any surviving children. Uh, but in 1880, they're in the Davenport census, or the federal census for Davenport. It's like, why am I being slow? We'll just do this, since I'm close. Maybe it's, there we go. Uh, this is the 1907 uh, Cedar Rapids city directory page. And so here you see Reverend Richard Hawley, COL for African American or colored. Uh, and then she's making a little bit of money for the family. She's working as a dressmaker. So you've got Richard and Mrs. Susan V. Hawley. Uh, I don't believe, I tr I've tried to look this address up. You know, Cedar Rapids, if you know their streets, they have all those directional names after the streets in many cases. So they were living at 62 17th Avenue. I don't know if that really meant southwest or what west means on uh, Cedar Rapids uh, uh, addresses. But that's where they are in, we'll reset that, see if uh, we're going to talk to you. There we go. And then here is 1910, they're still in Lynn County. Uh, so uh, I'm trying to think if Richard had died by then, I'm looking for the Hollies on this one. Uh, no, yeah, uh, there they are, yeah. He is uh, still li listed as a clergyman and she's listed as a dressmaker in 1907. And then he dies in the 19 teens. So in 1920, Susan then has moved in with her niece in uh, Chicago. So this is a Cook County uh, census sheet on this one. Uh, let's see. I had looked through this before uh, this, this morning so I could point these out and then I'm forgetting where she is. Too many census pages. Uh, and she is. She's living in the house uh, with her niece. So know that this is the page she's on. Let me find them. There, uh, oh, there we go. Oh, they spell it. That's, or they spell it differently, I should say. They spell H-A-W-L-E-Y. That's why I wasn't saying it. I forgot that. So she's living with Clara Jones, her niece. So it says aunt here. Uh, John Jones, Clara Jones, and Susan Hawley. So there she is. 
I need to remember that on that page. Uh, one of the things that we have done then around this story at the State Historical Museum is uh, we've got starting, uh, I think it's next fall, not this fall. Uh, so starting fall of 2021 now, not this, not last term, but this term, every grade level in Iowa has to have a unit on Iowa history. And so that's K through 12, not just fifth grade like a lot of us did, or sixth grade, or fourth grade. And it doesn't have to be, you know, all Iowa history, they just have to have an Iowa history unit. So we've started developing primary source sets uh, using primary documents, and we're working with the Library of Congress. So uh, our education team has been working with the teachers and the Department of Education Social Studies Coordinator, uh, Stephanie Wager, to let teachers know, hey, if you need materials to teach Iowa history, uh, this one is more, and, and we have it geared to grade level as well, so if you are a, you know, a K through three teacher, you can look for things that are K through three. Uh, but it's a partnership with Library of Congress and the State Historical Society. So we're actually getting federal grant money to do this project. Uh, we pay our staff. We have uh, another staff person that we've been able to hire on with those federal dollars. So, uh, but because it's a partnership with the Library of Congress, it doesn't get put in, you know, uh, Civil War to Reconstruction, Iowa, it gets put in U.S. history post-war because they use Brown versus Board of Education, but it uses the uh, Clark case. So uh, students in Iowa who want to use uh, our materials to talk about those cases, uh, we've got this available on, on the web and downloadable for teachers across the state. Uh, so that's something we've been promoting hard. Uh, and then I think when Gail and I first talked about this program it was probably August, so the next slide hadn't happened yet. But this fall, Muscatine voted to name their junior high, which was the grade level that Susan would have been in in 1867. Their new junior high is now going to be Susan Clark Junior High. So good for Muscatine, uh, good for Justice Cole, good for Susan Clark. Uh, and again, this is a case as Iowans we should be uh, aware of and proud of, but know that, again, we've been uh, fighting about this for generations and uh, fighting around these issues, not this, around different issues around access and equality, uh, and there are you know, still challenges today. Uh, not a contemporary story, but in doing some research in the 1960s in Des Moines, a uh, little before I was born, but 1963, uh, a religious council in Des Moines sent uh, an African-American couple and the man was dressed in a jacket and dressed nicely and the woman in a dress and then a, uh, a young college couple uh, out to try to rent apartments in Des Moines in the 1963 and, uh, and about 80% of them, the young uh, European-American ancestry couple would say, oh sure, we've got a place to rent to you and the African-American couple would, say, would, would be told, I'm sorry, we just rented that room. It's a really great series the Register did in the 1960s. So because of housing discrimination through the 20th century and what <clears throat> was being done, you still get a, a bit of de facto desegregation, or segregation, I should say, in, in schools because uh, oftentimes African Americans weren't being allowed to buy homes or live in neighborhoods where uh, they might want to live. So. Uh, there still were challenges all through the, the 20th century. I'm sure we've, we've cleared that all up now all across the board. So uh, we don't have to worry about that anymore. And with that, I am done. Thanks for coming out today. We've got time for some questions too. But uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm here for a little bit longer. He had his yeah, hand up well, first. I, yeah, I, I, I did curriculum work a lot. And uh, how, how are you going to do that at high school level? I know you can offer that unit. It's a mandate that all students have it. It is. It's a state. Uh, so you're going to have to find out a course that all the kids are in. And it doesn't have to be a course. So it could be in a literature course or in you know, government and saying, we're going to incorporate an Iowa history unit. So if you were teaching you know, separation of powers uh, or something, you could use uh, you know, const an Iowa constitution uh, historical debate or something. So it's it really complicated, though, when you get up to the upper grade levels and they've already been through the, the requisites and uh, this is where it's going to take place. 
Yeah. That's a good idea. Yeah. It, and it, 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 there, there's no guidelines on how long a section it has to be. You just have to have some unit that incorporates Iowa history. And there are, you know, it's not, I, I want to be careful with uh, the words I use because I'm a historian, not an educator. Uh, so there are content standards at each grade level. And so like for kindergartners, it's like spaces and places. So you could spend two days talking about Iowa rivers. And you know, the Mississippi River was one thing that drew people to Iowa. And if you spend you know, 30 minutes over two days talking about that with five-year-olds, you've met that standard. So I hear what you're saying on high school. I can't remember what the high school you know, themes are. To, a lot of times it ties in with what's either in US history in 11th or 12th grade in government or econ. Uh, in those grade levels, so that's part of what we're trying to do. Gail, I'll get you next, but he had his hand. I'll get get him after. Go first, yeah. So real quickly, was was Iowa the first state to have a uh, Supreme Court ruling like this, or were there others that preceded Iowa? You know, I'm not aware, so I can't say we were the first. I don't know of any other state that had a state Supreme Court ruling based on 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 race. Now, other states had desegregated uh, before us, but I don't know anybody else where it went to a state Supreme Court ruling. So okay, it related to that. I tried to look that up in Wikipedia. Yeah. And there, there's the only, there's no discussion of Iowa there. That would be a great addition. Probably so somebody else Burger was Burger. telling me I need I do. I have a Wikipedia account and I tried to look it up my login the other day and I know what it is, but my password wasn't working. So okay. there are a couple of things that I need to update. Yeah, that'd be uh, one is on that right now they've got Des Moines as having been on the like the monks still and it's like no it means of the Moingona people I mean that's how the Des Moines got its real name it's not of the monks or the mounds or anything along that line Gail what was your comment or question I'm gonna throw throw something out here can you talk a little bit about Alexander Clark's life after this because I think he's uh, pretty fascinating it, he really is I mean and I wanted to talk more about desegregation in, in Iowa but uh, it, Concurrent to his fight with his daughter to desegregate Iowa schools, as I said, he is fighting and trying to convince the Iowa Republican Party, who after the Civil War is, you know, the Democrats are in shambles because they're the anti-war party. Uh, and it's not till the Great Depression where the Democrats have any real legs in Iowa, again, as a political party. But uh, Clark goes to his Republican friends and says, hey, we tried before with that rewrite of the 57 Const 1857 Constitution to strike the word white. Let's try that again. So I think you guys all look like you're pretty smart and know how to change the Iowa Constitution, but I'm going to go over it anyway. It has to pass the legislature in two consecutive sessions. Not until 1970 did the Iowa legislature meet every other year. So in the 1870s, they meet in 67, uh, the governor could call a special session, which did happen in 68. So there's the 67 legislature, and then in 68, the legislature meets again and passes a strike the word white amendment uh, to the Iowa Constitution. And then in the fall of 68, it goes before the white men of Iowa. And whereas in 1857, the white men, 21 years or older, who chose to vote, crushed the strike the word white, in 1868, striking the word white win is, is struck from the Iowa Constitution. Uh, women were working hard to try to strike the word male. And in 1870, it passed the, or 70, 69 or 70, that passes the Iowa legislature. And then a woman named Victoria Woodhull, who was a national figure out of New York, makes some comments saying, essentially, I think women should have the right to get out of a marriage that's abusive. I mean, that was the case, but back then the language gets called free love. So it's not like free love, like 1960s free love. <laughs> it's free love in that, oh, you know, if you're in an abusive or in a dissatisfying marriage because of abuse, she was arguing you should have the right to get a divorce. That was not popular in the 1870s. And so after Victoria Woodhull makes those comments, a lot of Midwestern states, Iowa included, say we're not ready to give women the vote. Uh, and so that's why almost in 1916 we changed the Constitution again, but then it's wrapped up in prohibition. 
So now I'm way off Alexander Clark, sorry, but we're going back there. Uh, so let's do that. So women don't get the vote. Clark's, you know, not real open-minded about that. The other things that he does, his son Alexander Jr. is the first uh, African-American to get his law degree from the University of Iowa. That's, I think, 18... Uh, 74 or 79 maybe, 74, 79, somewhere in that range. So Alexander Clark's the first African-American to get a law degree, junior. And then Alexander Clark, the elder, is the first, the second to get a law degree from the University of Iowa. So he's the second African-American graduate. So uh, he, he and his family are promoting education and trying to take advantage of it all through the 1870s. And then President Harrison appoints him as, that's the story on her obituary, which is, you know, like, ambassador's daughter. Uh, he was appointed uh, ambassador to Liberia, and when he's in Monrav Monrovia, uh, he catches a disease and, and dies shortly after arriving, so he doesn't serve very long as a U.S. ambassador. But that's uh, Alexander Clark, you know, the... The, the Clarks do well by themselves with the advantages. He, he was owning property uh, widely in Muscatine. That was one profession where men uh, with African ancestry could, you know, uh, be respected and make a good living was a barber. You know, we think of barbers as kind of a uh, mid-level uh, profession today. Uh, for African Americans in the, the, and not to be critical of any hairstylists in the group, uh, Back in the 1850s, 60s, and 70s, that was a way for African Americans to have some status in their community. Uh, and they weren't necessarily just uh, serving the African American community, but would also serve uh, people of European ancestry too. So uh, he really is a remarkable story in his own right, but I uh, wanted to focus on Susan and desegregation a little bit more today. Yeah? Was there any uh, like black, I know the, the Iowa bystander wasn't in existence yet, at this time, but was there any black-owned newspapers or, or any kind of circulars that were going around discussing this? So, not really. Okay. Uh, the Iowa State Bystander, the Iowa Bystander, uh, is published shortly before 1900 <laughs> is when it goes into publication. It is a black-owned and operated newspaper out of Des Moines, carries news from especially southern Iowa. And part of that, I think, was connected to the fact that we didn't have a large African-American population in our state until coal mining starts uh, attracting more and more African-Americans. Uh, and as Jim Crow laws in the South get more and more oppressive, uh, Iowa, and, and especially around Oskaloosa, the coal mining, you've got a, a town with Quaker history, and Quakers and Congregationalists, but Quakers especially, tended to be tolerant and open-minded around equality uh, for women and people of different nationalities. So uh, a lot of the, the beginning of you know, kind of African-American activism uh, comes out of Oskaloosa up into Des Moines and other parts of the state then eventually, but you don't see a national uh, or a statewide paper really until the bystander. And the bystander mostly covers uh, maybe up to Fort Dodge occasionally. It doesn't really do Sioux City. Uh, John Notton and I were talking beforehand about an Iowan in the early 20th century, a guy named Oscar Michaud. And he's the first major African-American film producer in U.S. history. He was born in Illinois, moves to Dakota Territory and farms with the Homestead Act, and then moves to Sioux City in the early 19-teens. And there's this new media out there, <laughs> film, and he, so he writes a novel about his experience in farming called uh, The Homesteader, and then does a feature film with an all African American cast in, I think 1919 is when it's released, right after the war, but when he signs up for uh, the uh, draft in World War I, he lists as his profession film pro movie producer. So uh, that's a story, again, a lot of us in central Iowa don't know, but the first major African-American film producer is a man living in Sioux City who eventually moves to Chicago, and that's where he does most of his work, but his first start in movie work is, is out of Sioux City. So uh, uh, again, that's part of the stories that uh, digitizing things has made it so much easier to research and show you this stuff than me having to go to microphone and say, I wonder what page, and a lot of it's been indexed, but I wonder what page in the newspaper really would be. I wonder what page in the newspaper in that Monticello newspaper from 1868 talks uh, meanly about the Clark case. 
And for those of you who have done microfilm newspaper research, I mean, imagine trying to pick and choose, looking through, you know, 80 Iowa newspapers looking for Clark stuff. And I'm sure there's more out there. That's just the easiest stuff for me. And I, I spent a lot of time on it. It wasn't like, oh, there's a Clark thing. I guess I'll look at that. Uh, it took some digging for me to find even the ones I did. But I'm sure there's more cases out there, too, that are in newspapers. So getting back to your question, sympathetic publishers like the Hawkeye or the Cedar Rapids paper were certainly promoting equal rights around issues even before the African-American press uh, came, came uh, to rise. I mean, the earliest, whether you call it a riot or not, uh, is 1860 in Iowa in Grinnell. There are some freedom seekers, people who'd been enslaved, who have stopped in Grinnell because you've got this congregational uh, religious uh, Protestant group there who's sympathetic to uh, anti-slavery activity. And so there are like four adults and, and two children. And while they are in Grinnell in March of 1860, uh, they say, oh, we're going to send the younger people, the two students, to the local school. And people in Grinnell, some people in Grinnell, which, you know, was an open-minded town even then, uh, are out on the streets protesting with weapons and barring the school from these two children. So there's like a two-day period around integrating schools in Grinnell in 1860 uh, that, that uh, happens as well. So again, before we you know, feel too good about ourselves, know that there are other things out there, other, other, issue, uh, other instances where we're not always as, as good as we'd like to be. And, and to me, that's what is good about history is, is let's look to the bright spots and try to be like that Let's, uh, John, I'll get you in a second, but let's uh, <laughs> say liberties and rights, so like our state flag and our state motto, are for everyone. Uh, that's when, we'll, to me, we're at our best as islands. Our liberties we prize and our rights we will maintain applies to everybody. Go ahead, John. I was going to mention uh, regarding education specifically, a century later, you had the whole Amish um, yep. education uh, situation with, with the Amish wanting to. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's 66 or 65 yeah, thereabouts. And, yeah. Uh, and, and of course, the famous photo of the Amish children being sent to run across <laughs> the, the cornfield away from, from the people who are going to try to force them to go to public school. Yeah. If, if you'll indulge me for like a, another quick two minute story, and because this is K through 12 essentially, it doesn't apply to private colleges. And so, Highland Park College here in Des Moines in 1900, the, the way I've read the story in the papers, uh, Archie Alexander, who was a football player from Ottumwa, African-American, uh, really talented football player, is going to school at Highland Park. They bring in a student from the American South who says, I'm not gonna play on a football team with this African-American guy. I'm sure he uses different language than that. Uh, and Highland Park College put in a color line in the early 20th century, like 1904. So Archie Alexander transfers to the University of Iowa and becomes a nationally significant civil engineer uh, out of University of Iowa because he gets segregated out of Highland Park College here in Des Moines. So that's a, they, his family home when he was a grown up was just off of uh, Hickman and Chautauqua Park area. Uh, we've got a, a nice photo of a birthday celebration. And he also became an ambassador to the Virgin Islands. So, uh, <laughs> Uh, he was down there for a while. Or uh, yeah, maybe it wasn't an ambassadorship since Virgin Islands were technically part of the U.S., but the, the equivalent of. Go ahead. What uh, sorts of jobs did African Americans have in the pre-Civil War? Yeah, it, it typically was labor. Uh, you know, Farming just there were a few African American farm communities immediately after the Civil War and a little bit before. Uh, up in West Union, so Fayette County, Northeast Iowa, again, a Quaker community. Uh, in 1870, there's a small group of African Americans farming up in rural Fayette County. Uh, for the most part, in the Civil War era, you're working as a laborer. So you might be working uh, in Des Moines. Uh, you know, they wouldn't have used the, the term janitor, per se, but that's essentially what it was. Uh, there wasn't a, lo a lot of opportunity for like a white collarish job like a barber if you were an African American. Uh, you know, it's not till the 1870s, as we say, when you've got your first African American going to the University of Iowa Law School. So, uh, not, and 
Uh, there may have been African-American lawyers in Iowa before Alexander Clark Jr., but I'm not aware of any. Uh, so he may be essentially the first African-American lawyer in our state. Uh, and that was, as I said, I, it might be 79 when he graduates. I, I'd have to go back and look. And then uh, Alexander the Elder might be 1884. I know they were about five years apart. That's why I say that. Uh, so not a lot of opportunity. And then in that, uh, I'm trying to think of some of the other, like working for a steamboat company as a porter uh, along the Mississippi. So there, the 1873 case that's a big deal in Iowa is Kojer versus a steamboat company. And she's an African-American woman who is not being served uh, food on a steamboat. And she sues. So, you know, before Plessy versus Ferguson and equal accommodations or uh, segregation and accommodation, we've got a, a law in our or a Supreme Court ruling in 73 that says, no, you can't discriminate in public, in some public uh, accommodations in, in Iowa. So, uh, but again, then you've got people like Edna Griffin who has to uh, picket Katz Drugstore in Des Moines in 1949 because they won't serve her at the counter. So even though we've got a law in our books, uh, doesn't mean yeah. things always change <laughs> right away. Could you speak briefly on the video that the Drake Law Sure, yeah. So if you want to learn more about the case, uh, Drake University, because <clears throat> Justice Cole was one of the founders of Drake Law School, uh, they wanted to honor the story and, and him. And so uh, you might just be able to Google Susan Clark Drake University and get it. But if not, uh, I didn't go to my last slide. If you ever need to get me, and this will remind me to say what else I was going to say, uh, it's leo, my first name, dot landis at iowa.gov. Uh, thanks again to Gail and the West Des Moines uh, Historical Society. But if you have ancestors who aren't from West Des Moines and you've got collections that tell a great Iowa story, uh, we're always interested in collecting things at the State Historical Museum, and, and, and I'm your guy. It doesn't mean we can, can take them, but we'd at least listen to what you might have and that compelling story about your ancestors. So keep supporting West Des Moines Historical Society, but also don't have to do it by artifact donations, but support uh, your State Historical Society too. Uh, but if you want to find that Clark documentary that Drake did, and you can't find it online because Drake has it kind of buried, Feel free to say, I was at your West Des Moines talk. I'd like the link to the Drake uh, Susan Clark documentary. Yeah. Which they shot at the Jordan House. Yeah. That's what I was trying to, yeah. you know, I got to pump us up a little bit. <laughs> it's very, it's kind of and, and get, Yeah, it, it is. They read that whole letter from the Monticello. I was one of their consultants. So they read the Monticello letter. You will be uncomfortable <laughs> hearing it. It's uh, actors in contemporary clothing. Yeah reading some incredibly offensive language yeah. from these uh, newspaper documents. And it, it, it's uncomfortable as it well, well should be. So yep. thank you. You are welcome. Very Dale. wonderful. <laughs>